In this video, we're going to look at some basic audio settings, some MIDI settings, and your input-output labeling. Now, I have Pro Tools open here, and I want to open my most recent session. I can do it from the File menu, and there's a nice shortcut, Command-Shift-O, and that'll open the most recent session, and that's Control-Shift-O on Windows. Now, let's start with looking at our audio hardware. It's all done under the Setup window, Hardware and Playback Engine. Let's go to Playback Engine first, and here we select which playback engine we want to use. In this case, this is the third-party audio hardware that I'm using, and this is what's available on my system. And based on this being chosen here, if I go to the hardware page, we'll see it there, and I can launch the setup app that pertains to this specific piece of hardware. So let's go back to the playback engine, and let's go through the parameters here. Now, hardware buffer size is an important setting. The conventional wisdom is this. The lower the value is here, the more it reduces the input to output monitoring latency. So this is good for when you're recording, meaning a lower sample setting here will result in lower latency if you have a record arm track and you want to monitor your signal as you're playing or singing through the record arm track, it'll be less latency. If you have an instrument track and you're playing your MIDI keyboard, you'll experience less latency from the time you hit the key until you hear the sound. Now the cost of this is greater processing demands on your computer higher buffer settings, it goes all the way up to 1024, are useful for sessions with lots of native plugins. You get more processing power, greater latency, but that's not an issue when you're at the mixing stage. So you sometimes need to move these around depending where you're at in your workflow. So for mixing, higher values are good. For tracking, lower values are good. Now we have some settings here that pertain to the buffer setting. Ignore errors during playback. When this is enabled, if you're experiencing any overloads, you'll hear some clicks and pops, but it won't interrupt your workflow. And that's great if you're recording or working and you just want to, you're in your creative mode and you just want to work and you don't care about the sound at that moment. When that's off, you'll get some pop-up messages telling you that you're overloading your system. And that's important, obviously, if you're mixing. Now, when this is enabled, you'll see there's another option here, minimize additional I.O. latency. Now, the way it works is like this. When you enable the error suppression, the latency that it generates is a minimum of 128 samples. So what we can do is if you click that, you're going to limit the number of samples latency introduced by this to 128 samples. Now, if this is already set at 128 or lower, it doesn't matter because that's your latency anyway. But if it's higher, what happens is it'll limit the latency to 128 samples. And if it's disabled, it experiences or will cause a latency of half of this buffer setting. So there would be 512 samples, for example. Anyway, I'm going to leave it at 128 for now and I'll leave that off. Dynamic plugin processing is very useful. It optimizes the amount of plugins you can get in your session by dynamically reallocating your host-based processing power, meaning basically when a plugin isn't being used, it's not taxing the system. So really good to leave that on. And we have a separate video engine enable button over here, and that'll basically allow you to import, edit, and playback video within Pro Tools without any transcoding going on. And you can even have video playing back in your finder at the same time. So it really gives you a lot more video processing power. And it's great, but I'm going to leave it off for now since I'm not working with video for the moment. Now, you'll likely also have some MIDI devices connected to your system, and we have to make sure that Pro Tools sees that. And we do that from under the setup menu as well, MIDI. MIDI Studio, and this launches on Mac, the audio MIDI setup, and on Windows, it launches a little app called MIDI Studio Setup. So the important thing here is to make sure your device is recognized. I'm using a Novation Impulse keyboard controller, and I see it here, and it's fine. And if it's not recognized, make sure you have the proper drivers installed for your hardware, and then you can hit the Rescan MIDI button, and it'll rescan and should recognize it once it sees the drivers. And we can double-click and configure it. We can name it. And if you're using external MIDI synths, we can enable specific MIDI channels for input and output, and you can give it a color and a name and customize it like that. But the important thing is just that it be recognized here. So I'm going to hit quit for now, and it'll be available when we're working with MIDI tracks. In the next video, we'll continue with the I.O. setup.